Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us for Understanding Your Cat with Dr. Rachel Geller. Uh, Rachel Geller will deliver a presentation based on her book, Saving the World, One Cat at a Time, What I Know About Cats and Why You Should Know It uh, in this uh, Zoom webinar. So dub the cat whisperer, Dr. Rachel Geller will explain common cat behavior problems encountered by owners, uh, followed by a Q&A. So please, as I mentioned, uh, bring your questions and get some expert advice. Uh, whether your cat in question is avoiding the litter box, uh, acting hostile towards others, uh, having separation anxiety, or scratching the furniture, Dr. Geller has easy to implement solutions and answers based on her lifelong understanding of cats and their behavior. Dr. Geller will also offer advice on how to choose the perfect cat for your, for your household and how to integrate your cat successfully into your family. And a little bit more about Dr. Geller. She's a certified cat behavior and retention specialist through the Humane Society and a certified humane education specialist through the Academy of Pro-Social Learning. She is currently a cat behaviorist and uh, consultant for uh, several organizations, including the Cat Connection, uh, Here Today, Adopted Tomorrow, Animal Sanctuary, and Bay Path Humane Society. And she also provides cat behavior help both locally and throughout the country to her many clients, which include cat owners and shelters. So all 115 of us, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Rachel for joining us here tonight. And Dr. Geller, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And, you know, I will say, as a cat behaviorist, it's not really your typical job that a lot of people hear about or really know what we do. And I am often asked, why do you spend so much of your time helping cats? Maybe you should spend some time helping people. You know, there's a lot of people who could use your help too. But the truth is, whenever you help cats, you're also always helping people. Now, People tend to assume that if a cat has a behavior problem, that problem must be with the cat. Most of the time, this simply is not true. Many of these cats really are not difficult. They actually don't have behavior problems. And the fact is, often their humans have problems or their humans don't understand. And this creates problems for the cats. Now, Whenever a human being has a serious problem, such as illness, bereavement, job loss, divorce, a pandemic, you will often find a cat suffering at the other end of it. So I have learned that you really never help a cat without also helping a person. Now, don't get me wrong. I help a lot of people whose cats just won't use that litter box Cats who scratch on everything except for that lovely scratching post that you brought home for her. And what should you do when you bring home Fluffy as a companion for Puffy? And as it turns out, Puffy didn't want a new brother or sister all that much. But I also help a lot of people in distress. For example, a woman recently contacted me and she started off the whole conversation by saying she had to surrender her cat. She started off by saying she was sure there was really nothing I could possibly do to help. You see, she had cancer and several small children. She was terrified, exhausted, and completely overwhelmed. Amidst all of this, as if that wasn't enough going on, she had an older cat and she was feeling bad. She was feeling guilty that she couldn't give the cat enough attention. This woman and I talked for a very long time. Actually, I did most of the listening and she did a lot of the talking and that's okay. I listened to her describe her situation. And eventually I said, your children are stressed because you're sick, but they're going to feel even more stressed and more upset if they lose the family cat at the same time. I also reminded her that cats are fundamentally loyal, caring, and incredibly perceptive animals. So if her cat didn't get the same amount of attention for a period of time because she was getting treated for cancer, well, that's what families do. And that cat was part of the family. And that's, that's fine. I explained to her that the cat would surely prefer to give up some attention temporarily 
rather than to be separated from her family permanently. Sometimes people just need to be reassured. By then, the woman was crying. She said to me, do you really think it would be okay for me to keep my cat? So what I learned in this conversation was that this woman really did not want to give up her cat at all. She wanted to do the right thing. She just really wasn't sure what that was. So in the end, she kept her cat and I promised my help and support as she went through her cancer treatments. And this is really what I try to do every day. Work to solve behavior problems in cats so people do not have to sacrifice the cats who they love. Now, I do a lot of cat behavior counsels. I do between 900 and 1,000 cat behavior counsels every year. And I do these all completely free of charge. It's my personal mission in life that I never want there to be a financial barrier preventing somebody from keeping their cat in their home when the issue is a behavior problem. But when you work with that many cats and that many people, you start to notice some patterns out there and some myths and strange perceptions about cats. And so I'd like to take this opportunity to highlight a couple of interesting things that I've noticed a lot of people think. So first, cats do not act out of revenge or spite with their pee or poop. Oh, I hear tales of woe. She peed on my bed to teach me a lesson. She peed on my laundry because she was mad at me. She peed on my luggage because she was upset that I went away on vacation. She peed on my shoes because she does not like my new boyfriend. Well, actually, maybe that one could be true. Cats are very good judges of character. But in all seriousness, I want everyone to know that cats do not pee inappropriately out of spite or revenge. Now, I understand that it really is easy to assign human qualities to cats because they actually really do share so many of our emotions. But spite and revenge are qualities that we humans can proudly call our very own. Cats don't pee inappropriately to spite you or to get back at you or to teach you a lesson. Cats don't think in terms of right or wrong the way we do. So if your cat is using the box, she's not doing that because it's the morally correct thing to do. She's using that box because it meets her needs, it's in a good location, it has a litter that she likes, and the box is feels safe to her. If she's not using the litter box, she's trying to solve that problem of, be, of something being wrong with that box, and she's solving that problem as a cat. So many times when there are litter box issues, it's because there's something wrong with the box or the placement. And she's a cat. So she's using cat tools to find a way to solve that problem. Second, you know that big basket of toys you have sitting in the living room. And every once in a while, you throw a few toys on the floor and you say, OK, we're going to play. Or do you have that big bucket? And every once in a while, you, know, you throw them out or you toss them in the air. And you expect your cat to play. And then people say, Oh, my cat doesn't like to play. Well, throwing a bunch of solo toys on the floor is not play. With solo toys, the cat has to pretend that he's both the predator and the prey. And this is not very realistic to your cat. So many times people say to me that their cats don't play. Oh, my cat's lazy. She doesn't play. Oh, my cat's fat. She doesn't play. My cat's too old to play. But the problem is we don't take the time to play with our cats in a way that triggers their prey drive. What I see a lot of times happen is people will start to play and they give up too soon. So think about a cat who's really, you know, um, on a hunt outside to get that prey. She's going to be a little strategic about it. She's going to size up the situation. She wants to figure out all of her moves, like maybe if you're playing a game of chess. So. If you start the game and in the middle of her hunting sequence, you decide she's not um, playing soon enough and you pick up the toy and you walk away, well, you've just 
inadvertently taught your cat that you're not going to be patient enough to give her a real play session. So it's really important to play in a way that resembles a hunt. And the best way to do this is with a fishing pole type toy. And as you're using the fishing pole type toy, think about simulating a successful hunt. The nice thing about the fishing pole is you can, you can maneuver it and you can move it around in a way that prey would act. Now for your cat, the most important part of the game is the capture. So many people think that the point of the game is how long you can keep that toy away from the cat. I see people playing and as soon as the cat gets close to the toy, eh, they yank it away again. But the truth is you want to let your cat have multiple captures. It's the captures that make the cat feel good. It's the captures that make the cat feel confident. Your cat is going to feel empowered and brave and happy when she has the physical, tangible success that comes from watching, stalking, pouncing, and ultimately capturing. The capturing is the rewarding part. Cats expect to catch and kill, and then they expect to be able to eat their prey after the game. So stay with the game for a while. Intersperse the chasing and the pouncing with plenty of captures. Now, to make it a perfect play experience and to really simulate a hunt, finish the game with one last final capture. And after this final capture, now give your cat a little treat to simulate that feast after the hunt and after the capture. When you follow the capture with a treat, your cat's brain is gonna release all of those feel good chemicals. And your cat's going to feel like king of his territory or queen of her castle. And that's really how you want your cat to feel. The whole point of the game, the whole point of a hunt is to get that capture and then eat what they caught. So really make sure that you simulate a hunt, multiple captures during the game, and then Think about how prey would act. Um, as the game's going on, the prey is getting tired. The prey is getting injured. The prey dies. Wind the game down. Make it realistic. And after that last final juicy capture, we're going to give your cat a little bit of food. And that is going to be life-changing for your cat. I, I promise you that you'll have a very strong, powerful bonding experience if you play in this way. Now, I've talked a lot about you know, how important the capture is and how we want to simulate a hunt. So now it's time for me to talk about laser pointers. I really wish that pet supply stores did not sell laser pointers as toys. They were developed to be used for PowerPoint presentations in the office, and that is where they should stay. Laser pointers are actually the cause of so many behavior problems in cats. Think about it. Your poor cat is on this futile chase, pointlessly trying to capture that little red dot that can never be captured. Certain of a sure cat, your cat pounces, only to find there's nothing there. There's nothing between his paws. There's nothing in his mouth. There's nothing between his teeth. It's very frustrating for a cat. Laser pointers can create frustration and anxiety in cats. And this is the exact opposite of what we want to do when we play with our cats. Interestingly enough, laser pointers can even create problems between companion cats. If the cat can't get a capture when you're playing with the laser pointer, she's gonna to try to get that capture and that feeling of being able to bite into something and rip it apart and eat it in some other way. So she may now pounce and stalk the companion cat and take out that frustration and anxiety on a companion cat in the household. And the other thing that she might do is take it out on you. So if you have a cat whose only stimulation and opportunity for hunt is your ankles when you're walking by, you're gonna have a cat who bites your ankles for that feeling of satisfaction and capture and, um, and, and really working that prey drive. So it's really important to toss those laser pointers. 
laser pointers cause confusion because your poor cat is chasing that dot, but she can never catch the dot. It's constant frustration. And there's no way to really explain what you're doing to the cat. Laser pointers do not provide a physical, tangible catch after stimulation. And cats need this. Cats are natural born hunters and they need to have that opportunity to hunt. So it's very important to really um, not frustrate your cat, but keep your cat happy and content with play sessions that involve um, simulation of a hunt, using the prey, using the prey, you know, the toy at the other end of the fishing pole in a realistic way, and really giving your cat that reward, which is the food after play. Laser pointers are an unwinnable game for the cat. I often find the people who tell me their cats are aggressive or destructive are cats whose owners use laser pointers as their method of play. So play smart, play safe, and play in a way that satisfies your cat's natural hunting muscles, her natural instinct to catch and kill, and use that fishing pole type toy with your cat. You will definitely notice a difference in your cat. So the last little myth I would like to address is cats do not want privacy when it comes to their litter boxes. Now I know we all love covered litter boxes because from a human perspective, we think that we're giving our cats privacy, but we are placing a human need onto our cats. Cats actually want the complete opposite with their litter boxes. They want a full, clear, visual field all the way around them. They want to be able to see and they want to know that they have ample visual warning time and potential for escape. And a covered box does not do this for the cat. A covered box completely blocks the visual field and a covered box does not allow for escape. Think about a potential invader or opponent coming into a covered litter box. Not only is the only means of escape right into that other cat's face, but that's very scary and unsettling for a cat. So we really need to remember that cats are in a vulnerable position when they are in their litter boxes. They want and need to be able to see all the way around them. Your cat needs to know that she can escape should an opponent or invader appear. And it's important to remember that these opponents or these invaders can be real or imagined. Even an only cat in a household who never goes outside has this instinctual need to know that she is safe from any type of ambushing or attack from any type of enemy, companion cat, or so forth. Um, it's, it's really important to remember that cats won't go into the litter boxes if they feel um, afraid about the location of the box or if the box is covered. So if you have your box in a location where she can't see around her, like wedged behind the toilet or under a desk or in a cabinet, these are all locations that will really cause litter box aversion. So we want privacy. We don't want anyone to see what we're doing. We're in the bathroom, but your cat wants the complete opposite. So toss the covers off those boxes, bring those litter boxes out from the walls, take them out from the corners. And oftentimes that, that is enough to solve your out of the box experiences with your cat. So how did I get here? People ask me all the time, what did you do to become a certified cat behaviorist? Why did you want to be a cat behaviorist? So I guess like a lot of things in life, I'm gonna go ahead and blame my parents. My parents' views on pets, cats or otherwise, could not have been more different. My dad grew up in Dorchester, Massachusetts, and he grew up in a small, crowded apartment that his immediate family shared with his extended family. Now, this apartment did not allow pets, but it didn't really matter. There wasn't any room for pets anyway, and my father's family was very poor. They were barely able to feed themselves. On the other hand, 
My mother grew up in a single family home where cats and other pets were cherished family members and the cats were part of the family and cats and dogs were really welcomed into her home. Later in their marriage, my parents were forced to strike a bit of a compromise about pets in our home when their firstborn, me, seemed to have discovered an endless parade of cats in the neighborhood who really needed me and who somehow ended up at our house because I had to take care of these cats. But with these cats came lessons in responsibility and lessons in being a good cat caregiver. And I remember this story, it could have happened yesterday. It's still so clear in my mind. I was sitting at the breakfast table, having my breakfast, and my dad walked down the stairs and he saw me eating and he said, Rachel, have you fed your cats yet? And I said, oh no, dad, but I promise, as soon as I finish breakfast, I'm gonna go and feed the cats. And my dad made me stop. And he said, no, you need to take care of their needs first. They are vulnerable. They are dependent on you. You assume that responsibility to be their caregiver. So you need to always feed your cats before you take care of yourself. Make sure those beings that are dependent on you are taken care of first, and then you can go ahead and eat your meal. And that lesson very much stayed with me. And I will say, the first thing I do to this very day when I wake up is I take care of my cats first. I feed my cats before I feed myself. I check their water, fill their water bowls, clean their litter boxes, and so forth. And that idea of really being responsible and caring for cats, I think, put me on that path to where I am right now. I deeply loved all of these cats, and I mourned their loss when one died. And at some point, I began to memorize the names and the faces of all of the cats who had lived, loved, and then died at our house. One day I asked my dad whether he thought all of those cats would meet me in heaven and whether they would recognize me and I them. He assured me that they would, that they would remember me and I would remember them forever. Looking back, the lesson I learned maybe wasn't about each individual cat per se, but it was about the idea that these cats' lives mattered that the bonds that we had were real, that these cats had souls, they were beings, they were beloved companions, and that they were really worth saving. And that um, lesson really stayed with me. And today I really dedicate myself to saving cats, making sure cats are happy, making sure cat owners are happy. And this, for me is really what it's all about to be a cat behaviorist. So thank you so much to Xperia Library and all of the other libraries that are tuning in. And my name is Rachel Geller. I'm a certified cat behaviorist and I'm ready to take all of your cat behavior questions now. Thank you. Rachel, wonderful job, wonderful job. We have about 30 minutes for questions. I have spotlighted Rachel, so ho hopefully no one is seeing my ugly mug. We're gonna keep Rachel on the screen. Uh, Rachel, I'll read the questions from the Q&A and from the chat box. We already have like 30 questions, so this is, this is gonna be something else. <laughs> um, okay, so Kelsey asks, any recommendations for brushing a cat who hates being brushed, but needs to be brushed regularly? So in general with cats, you never want to go from zero to 60. So I would recommend not starting off doing her whole entire body. So what I would say is approach this gradually and incrementally, and it's fine to use treats as a little reward as well. So to start off with the, with the place on her body that she is most accepting of a little bit of brushing. And for the majority of cats, and, and you know your cat the best, but for the majority of cats, it's kind of like maybe the top of the head, a little bit in the back of the head, and maybe the top of, the, of her back. So start off just brushing her there. Have a few sessions where you just brush that much. During the time you're brushing, you can give her treats. 
you can talk to her in a soothing tone. You can let her know how much you love her. And she's going to get all of these um, messages from your voice in a soothing tone that this is all okay. When that's going well, maybe add in another inch. So now I get to brush a little bit of a longer area. And when that starts going well, you can add in um, more of her body, maybe another inch or so, and try to increase the duration of the session. So don't just jump in doing her whole body um, and don't just jump in expecting to brush her for like 20 minutes. Start small, when that goes okay, add in a little more time and add in a little more of the body for the brushing experience and follow her lead, go at the cat's pace and just um, get her used to the brush incrementally and gradually. Uh, Cheryl asks, how do you know the difference between a love nip, uh, a you're overstimulating me bite and a you're bothering me bite? Well, <laughs> um, it may it may not be that different between the two camps. So typically cats um, will let you know when they've had enough. So the most important thing that you should do is try to get a, try to get a read on your cat's signals. Some cats, their tails will start going back and forth a little more quickly. Some cats, you'll see their fur kind of tighten up. Some cats will start glancing at your hand. Glancing at your hand is a big tip off that the bite might be coming. So you can do a couple of things with cats who become overstimulated. One thing is if you think your cat has petting aggression, so if this happens a lot when you're actually petting your cat, try to get a handle, start keeping track of how long that cat will allow petting before that switch flips and she turns around and bites. So for example, let's say your cat will let her pet her for two minutes. And when you start going over that threshold, a bite happens. So from now on, stay below that threshold. Don't let it get to the point of overstimulation and only pet her for one minute. So, so keep it under that kind of line, just pet her and then stop. So now what you're doing is you are um, leaving her in a, a feeling of being very content before she gets to that point of overstimulation. So it's always better to leave the cat content and perhaps even wishing she had more rather than getting to the point where she doesn't like it anymore. So that's one thing you could do for the, if it happens during petting. The other thing is, you know, going back to the play that I talked about, if your cat is not getting enough stimulation, which is not getting enough opportunities to sink her teeth into something through play sessions that simulate a hunt, th those are times you'll see your cat bite as well. So my two pronged advice is add an interactive play sessions to your, your day with your cat, make sure she gets plenty of captures, final capture, food, so she sinks her teeth into something that's realistic, and just be aware of those signals and stay below her threshold of overstimulation. Uh, so speaking of food, uh, Deborah asks, why do cats not like to eat cold, wet food? And Jill asks, what is the best wet food to feed your cat? Okay, well, I don't really like to eat cold, wet food either. So I can kind of relate to that. It doesn't sound that enticing. But, you know, cats are all very individual. So some cats like the food a little warmer because that tends to release the aromas. So maybe for um, if your cat is older or she just doesn't have a great sense of smell, food that is cold and wet doesn't release the same type of aroma um, as smells for the cat. But it's very individual. There are cats who like um, the food a little a little chill. There are cats who like to play with ice cubes. So it, it all depends on your cat. In terms of um, what cat food I recommend, I always say to people, I recommend the cat food that your cat will eat and that fits into your budget. So, you know, there are all kinds of very high end cat foods and, and organic and, you know, so forth. But if your cat doesn't like it, it's not going to be, you know, that beneficial to your cat. So, you know, choose a food that if you go to any, you know, reputable pet supply store like Petco or PetSmart or, you know, Amazon or Chewy or any of those types of places, they're going to sell food that has been um, identified as, as nutritionally acceptable for a cat. So, you know, find what she likes. If your cat tends to only like dry food, just 
just make sure she has plenty of water available because they're not going to be getting the water content that they would with wet food. But at the end of the day, so many cats are very picky about not only flavors, but texture, temperature, you know, all that type of stuff. So, um, you know, find what she likes and stick with that. I always say to people, don't go crazy with all these different types of cat food. I mean, if you walk down the aisle of a pet supply store, there's like hundreds of different combinations. But if your cat was outside, um, she wouldn't be getting that selection of shrimp feast with chicken and tuna fricassee with rice. So you don't really need to off offer a lot of options. Uh, Isa asks, uh, do you prefer scheduled feedings or free feeding cats, especially in a multi-cat household? And we also had a question earlier. Uh, someone wanted to know, what is the name of your cat? <laughs> so, okay. So I'll save the names after I answer the question. Sure. So, um, so what was the first question? Yeah, I'm sorry. I just saw your cat pop up, so I wanted to ask their name. Uh, so oh, Isa okay. asks, do you prefer scheduled feedings okay. or free feeding cats, especially in a multi-cat household? Yeah, so free feeding is probably a little better for all of the cats because if you could put multiple bowls of food throughout the house, you're not going to get into that situation where there's resource guarding or one cat eats the other cat's food. And the other thing I like is I always like to... Um, tell people to break up the cat's portion of the meal into several small bowls and place the bowls around the house. And this way your cat has to go on a fun expedition to find his food and to eat his food. It's just another way to get cats to exercise a little more and tie in that food with the hunting um, experience, you know, kind of stalking and finding where things are. And it's just a great way for stimulation too for indoor cats. But, you know, sometimes this depends on your cat, too. I mean, I have, I have one cat who, if I left out all the food all day, she would just eat it all. She um, She's a little chubby. So, you know, that doesn't work so well for her. But I think when there's a few cats in the household that have multiple feeding stations and making the feeding stations fun um, really goes a long way to keeping the cats happy with each other and keeping the cats free from some of those negative behaviors like food obsession and resource guarding. Uh, my oh. favorite, my, oh, and go this, ahead. This cat's name is Elijah. Oh, very nice. Uh, my favorite, a lot of great questions. My favorite question so far comes from Carrie. She writes, my cat likes to scream at me. How can I get her to stop? <laughs> so, um, all right, here's what we're going to do. So we're going to use a method that I call distraction and redirection. So here goes. When your cat starts to scream, I want you to whip out that fishing pole type toy and trigger your cat's prey drive. Once we trigger the cat's prey drive, we're taking your cat out of that anxious mode into the positive mode of a hunter. So even though your cat may have been screaming or meowing, there's something that's bothering her, there's something that has to get out, we want to release that tension. We want to release that anxiety and we want to do it in a positive way. So redirect your cat to the toy and then go right into a little impromptu interactive play session. Make sure the cat's getting all kinds of captures. Move the fishing pole type toy like prey. Sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. Slither around across some furniture, scurry underneath something. Make the, get the cat involved in a really great, robust, interactive play session. And again, wind the game down. Prey gets injured and tired. Prey dies. Food. So now we've just um, provided a cat with something very positive to do instead of the um, screaming or meowing. This is a positive way to retrain your cat. And your cat will learn that when she doesn't scream or doesn't meow like that, she's going to have positive things happening. She's going to get playtime. She's going to have the opportunity to hunt. She's going to have time with you. And she's going to satisfy that, um, that you know, she's going to help, help release the anxiety and the tension. Now, the best part about this whole thing is once the cat has the hunt and um, gets the capture and eats the prey, 
now she goes, she taps into her completely natural hunt, eat, sleep cycle. So now she's gonna be ready for a nap and you'll get some nice quiet time. So Marina asks, uh, so first she says, thank you, Rachel. Uh, my yeah. cats are pretty anxious and I need to go abroad to visit my family for the first uh, uh, time in two years uh, in a few months. How do I prepare my kitties for this separation? I've been with them 24 seven since we adopted them a year ago. Yeah, and that's a big problem with a lot of the people who adopted during the pandemic, right? That the cats, the only life that a lot of these cats have known is you being home all the time. So a couple of things to help ease the way. If you can, between now and the time you know you're leaving, see if you can do a few overnight so your cats get used to you not being there. The other thing that would be great is have your cat sitter start coming over now. Let your cats bond and get to know the cat sitter so they don't freak out that there's a person in my house that I've never met before and I don't know where my human is. And this is a very bad situation, time to panic. So you really wanna make sure that the cats start gradually getting used to you not being in the house all the time. If you're working from home, you're trying to go out and do your work in some other places, try to take a couple of weekends away, get the cat used to you not being there. And it's really important to have that cat sitter come over, have the cat sitter play with the cats, have the cat sitter interact with the cats, have the cat sitter feed the cat. So this will really help. Um, you know, chances are your cats are going to be a little anxious anyway, just because it's going to be a very big change. But the more we can do to replicate what their life will be like while you're gone, the better off your cats are going to be. You know, you could try um, plugins too, like Feel Away or Comfort Zone. That might help as well. Uh, Allison asks, how do I get my cat to stop bringing baby bunnies and chipmunks into the house? Well, um, you know, cats, some cats are very proud of their captures and they want to share. And they're looking at looking at this as, you know, love. So from a cat's perspective, this is really a very nice gesture. Although from the human perspective, we're not so thrilled with having dead rodents and bunnies and so forth, you know, in the house. So if there's a way that you can greet the cat, maybe in the vestibule or if you have a mudroom before the cat comes in, that would probably be, you know, the best thing that you can do. Sometimes I say to people to try to have a, um, a greeting area, you know, in a place where you, where it's kind of neutral and not coming into the house. And then that cat will get used to that greeting area as the place to sort of deposit the things that um, she's bringing in. Um, you can also use a fishing pole toy again, you know, when the cat first comes into the house and kind of distract her from, you know, the, the prey that she has and get her a little bit interested in the prey with the toy. And then she'll release the, the dead animal and can kind of toss it out. But, you know, in general, that's something that the cat is doing out of love. So it would be kind of, it, it's a, that's a tough one to break because the cat's doing it as a gift. But see if you can set up like a little greeting area right where the door is and make it a positive place. Like that's the place that you always greet your cat. It's the place where you pet your cat. It's a place where you maybe um, talk in a nice tone to your cat and sort of make that the area that the hellos and goodbyes happen and she'll get used to dropping her captures there. Uh, Michelle asks, uh, why does my cat fight me on clipping her nails? We just can't do it. And we've tried different clippers, et cetera. And Karen says, I assume nail clipping is the same procedure as brushing, but if there's anything else you could add for successful nail trimmings, what would it be? Yeah, so it's definitely the same idea. You know, when the cat is very young, you want to start off touching her paws a lot, getting the cats used to having her paws touched. You want to kind of put your hand into that paw pad and, and separate out the nails. All those feelings and movements that you need to do for nail clipping, you know, the younger you can start with the cat, getting used to it, the better. So not everybody has that situation. If you adopted a cat when she was older, you know, 
that ship may have sailed a little bit. So you, you might want to bring the cat to a groomer. But in general, you know, starting off slow and providing rewards and providing positive reinforcements is, a, is the best way to get a cat to tolerate anything. And just remember, I'm using the word tolerate. I'm not using the words gleefully embrace. You may have some cats who really never love that feeling, but at least if they tolerate it, um, you know, that's a big plus. Sometimes too, it helps to give the cat something calming. There are all kinds of calming aids that are available without a prescription. Um, there's like composure for cats and there's a few different, if you do a Google search, um, like calming chews or calming aids that might help a little bit. You can also try spraying a little bit of feel away or comfort zone on your hands. So these are products that are synthetic pheromones that mimic a cat's natural pheromones. So you know, when your cat is always depositing her scents on you, those are the feel good pheromones right here. And um, comfort zone and feel away are synthetic versions of those. So the cat's tricked into thinking that, you know, this is a good experience. This is something calm. She's, uh, you know, she'll think that she already made those deposits as part of a feel good um, experience for her with the nail clipping. But if it's really, really, you know, undoable, and, you know, if you have a cat who turns into Cujo when it's time to cut her nails, I do suggest bringing the cat to the veterinarian and let him do it. You know, maybe he might need to sedate the cat a little bit. They usually have a couple people in the office who can help. So don't, you know, don't worry too much about that because it's, it's a common problem and most veterinarians are fine and skilled with helping with that. Uh, Mabel asks, uh, does a cat moving their tail slowly mean they don't like to be patted? Uh, so what, what can we tell from a cat's tail? So, yeah. So people assume, you know, dogs, when they're happy, they wag their tails, right? And the happier they are, the more the tail is wagging. Cats are the complete opposite. If a cat's tail is kind of lashing back and forth or twitching, that's a sign that she is agitated. So if you see your cat doing that, you know, stop whatever it is that you're doing. She's giving you a signal. She's communicating to you in some way that, you know, whatever's going on isn't making her happy. And if you see that tail going back and forth, it's a good opportunity to kind of take a step back and, and discontinue whatever it was that you were doing. Um, a cat is, uses their tail to express happiness, to express fear, to express aggression. So, you know, the more you can kind of get in tune with your cat's particular tail movements, the better things will be between the two of you. So in general, um, if the cat's tail is just up, or even if there's a little curve at the tip, that's happiness and that's contentment. If the, if the tail is angled down, that's usually maybe more fear and aggression. If you see the cat's tail get all puffy, um, that means the cat's getting ready to go into battle. So the reason the cats puff out their tail is to let other cats, some of whom may be rougher or tougher than your cat, know, you know, get the idea that the cat's really big and stronger than she really is. So yeah, the tail is a great way to kind of get a read on your cat's emotions. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, is there a particular type of litter that's best to use? Uh, for example, unscented versus scented, uh, clay versus uh, other, uh, et cetera. So I've had the best luck with um, litters that are unscented. So you want something that will replicate what the cat would get outdoors. And typically the soil and earth outside is not perfuming and scented. So some scented litters don't feel great to some cats, but you know, it all depends on your personal cat. My go-to litter when someone's having a litter box problem is Dr. Elsie's Cat Attract Litter. It has herbs in it that attract the cat to the box. It has a soft, sandy texture that I find a lot of cats love. So that's one that I'll recommend to many people if they're having a litter box problem. But, you know, again, just like people, they all have their individual preferences. You know, they, if they were at a shelter that used a certain type of litter, um, that might be the best litter to continue using with that cat. So, and once you find a litter that your cat likes and uses, try not to switch it up. 
So whatever she does like, you know, just stick with that. To us, you know, it may not make a big difference, but to your cat, it's a huge big deal. Uh, so folks, we're gonna take 10 more minutes of questions. Uh, so stick with us. Uh, Kelsey asks, uh, my cat likes to eat tufts of her fur she finds on the floor. Uh, why does she like to do this? And how can we redirect her apart from sweeping up as much as possible? Uh, in a note, she is the only cat in the household. And on a related note, uh, Rachel, anything we can do to um, decrease uh, the amount of, uh, of hairballs uh, that cats um, produce? <laughs> so, yeah. So there are cats. It's a phenomenon that will... Um, lick and eat their own fur. They'll lick and eat their own throw up. Um, that's just something that doesn't bother some cats. So if your cat is the type of cat that licks and eats the fur on the floor, I mean, rest assured, it's not going to really hurt her any. Um, it probably seems more yucky to us than it does to the cat. But there are so many, so many reasons why a cat may eat something that we don't want that cat to eat. You know, maybe. Um, the cat's not getting enough fiber in her diet. Maybe it's just reassuring to be eating something that has her smell on it. There are many, many different reasons. Sometimes I'll say to people, if their cats are chewing on things like plastic or, or, the, or their own fur or whatever, to add a little plain pumpkin puree into their cat food. Um, there are many cat, cat food brands that make plain pumpkin puree that's designed for cats. Um, Cats don't mind the taste. It's very high in fiber, and they also get extra water. So it's a it's kind of, sometimes something like that might solve the problem. You can always distract and redirect a cat from doing something you don't want her to do. So if you see her go to her fur, you can certainly whip out that fishing pole type toy, engage the prey drive, move her away from that fur as her eating target into something more positive again, after having to do with um, captures and a feast after the hunt. So um, anytime you want to, if there's ever a negative behavior that you want to sort of get your cat out of, distraction redirection with a fishing pole type toy leading into a play session is consistently like the best way to create a new habit and to, tr to train your, your cat in a positive manner. Uh, Susan says, my five month old kitties, uh, their sisters, go crazy running around and sometimes knock things over, including lamps. Uh, do you think they'll outgrow this? Uh, and your information has been very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. So if they're very young, yes, chances are they will outgrow some of this. If your cat is getting, you know, having fun by knocking things over, you know, again, add in more play and stimulation to your cat's life. So if your cat's only form of stimulation and fun is to knock things over, that's what she's going to do. They need to be stimulated, they need to get captures, they need to stalk, they need to run around. So add in a couple of play sessions um, to your cat's world and that could possibly solve the problem. The other thing you could do is provide some other enticing things that don't involve um, knocking over a vase or whatever. So. I'm a big fan of a toy called a puzzle feeder. So what this is is a type of toy where the cat has to overcome some challenge or manipulate the, the toy in some way that will yield some food when she gets it correctly. So it's very stimulating for a cat. It keeps the cat busy. You know, busy cats are cats who aren't gonna run about the house and be destructive. And after she accomplishes this task or overcomes the obstacle or gets things lined up the same way and gets that food. Again, we have now just tapped a cat into her completely natural hunt, eat, sleep cycle. And she's gonna feel very good and relaxed and happy. And when you get your cat feeling good and relaxed and happy after doing you know, one of these techniques, um, interactive play or the um, puzzle feeders, She's going to go to that again the next time she wants to get stimulation or release energy or stress because that was very rewarding, way more rewarding than, you know, knocking something off a shelf. So many great questions. Um, Jennifer says, my boys moved away for college and now our cat is seemingly lonely and depressed. 
how can I help? Oh, yeah, that's a tough one. You know, cats are very reactive to change. Cats like predictability. Your cat's perfect life would be, you know, if every morning she woke up at the same time, you never left the house, your kids never got any older, you never made any changes, you never got new furniture. So change does stress out a cat and stress is a cat's worst enemy. So again, let's um, add in a few interactive play sessions. So the cat um, boosts confidence, the cat feels good, the cat creates new positive associations with their home without your, without your kids now that they're off. So add, you know, whenever the cat loses something, you always want to add in an equally enticing and appealing um, activity, maybe even better. So, you know, add in those puzzle feeders, add in those interactive play sessions, add in some distraction and redirection. And even the things like um, cat grass, you know, they can kind of munch on and have fun with. Think of things you could add into the cat's life to replace the part of her life that she lost. Uh, Lil, we have a couple of questions along these lines. Uh, Lily asks, why does my cat lick and chew plastic bags? So, yeah, this is actually pretty common in cats. And there's a few reasons why. Some of these bags are actually made with a product that is a, a derivative, derivative of meat. So some of these plastic bags actually have an ingredient in them. We, we, really, we can't smell it because our smell our sense of smell is not as good as a cat's. But sometimes the cats detect that meat or beef byproduct in the plastic bags. And so they want to, you know, look and chew it. Some cats, it's pica behavior, which means it's a nervous, a nervous habit. If your cat is um, chewing on plastic because of nerves, again, this is a cat we want to get to chew and bite um, appropriately. So here's a cat who needs more interactive play. Some cats go after the plastic for the fiber issue. Um, we, we don't always know why, but for, for whatever reason, there are some cats who do need more fiber in their diets. So those are the three most common reasons that your cat is going after the plastic. So, um, you know, keep it away from the cat the best you can and add in some other things. You know, we're taking the plastic away, so we wanna add in something just as good. So puzzle feeders, try the pumpkin puree for the fiber. Um, interactive play sessions, interactive solo toys, and that will help. Uh, Deborah asks, how do I get my cat to the vet without a hassle? <laughs> so, yeah, they really don't like the carriers too much, right? Because to your cat, it's just basically a traveling prison cell to a scary place. So they learn that pretty quickly. So what I usually recommend to people is, have the carrier out in a room, like it's just another benign piece of furniture. Um, take the door off or tie the door back with a pipe cleaner so the door won't slam. Line the carrier with some cozy blankets or quilts, maybe spray the carrier with feel away and just have it out in your room in a place where you guys hang around a lot. Oh, it's just another cozy place to get in and have a nap. Um, and then we want to start a process where we work, we work to get the cat used to being in the carrier. So maybe put some treats or food, you know, right outside the carrier. And when you're eating those, see if you can get the food in the carrier. See if the cat will go into the carrier, eat the treat, and then come out. So once we have the cat venturing into the carrier a little bit with the treats, now we can move forward. So the next time the cat goes into the carrier, close the door hold it a few seconds, open the door, and let the cat back out. Now, don't do this every time the cat goes in for a treat because we want this to be intermittent. So sometimes the cat gets the treat and come back out. Sometimes the cat gets the treat, the door closes, hold it for a few seconds, open the door, let the cat back out. Once this is going okay, now we're going to go on a little trip, sort of. So cat goes into the carrier, eats the treat, you close the door, walk around your house, place the carrier back in the exact spot that it was, let the cat out. Do this a few times. When that's going well, now we can maybe take the cat into the carrier to the car, drive around the neighborhood, come back, carrier goes back in its spot, cat comes out and everything's fine. 
So what we want to do is teach the cat that for, for the most part, nothing terrible is going to happen when she gets into that carrier. For the most part, she's going to come out of that carrier. Things are fine and she's okay. Nothing harmed her. Nothing was dangerous. So eventually she's going to learn that the carrier is not going to be the scary thing that she thinks it is. Now, as I said before, we're just getting her to be okay in the carrier. She's not going to joyfully embrace the, the idea of it, but she'll be more okay. You can also, you know, again, there are calming chews. There are all kinds of products on the market to help a cat, you know, relax. And, you know, worst case scenario, talk to your veterinarian about maybe a little bit of a sedative to help the cat, you know, not be so terrified. Because if you think about it, if somebody put you into a box and brought you to a very strange place, you'd be calling the police. So it is very scary to a cat. Uh, so Rachel, we're gonna begin to wind it down. Uh, folks uh, in the chat, if you haven't already, uh, let uh, Dr. Geller know uh, how much you enjoyed uh, tonight's presentation. And uh, Rachel, let me ask you two last questions. We did start a couple of minutes late because my laptop wanted to do an update, of course. Uh, so uh, Lisa asks, uh, is there a particular kind of cat you recommend for an older first time cat owner? Well, um, if, the, if the person is older, the first thing I would say is get an older cat. Because, you know, a, from, from my perspective, for a senior citizen to adopt a very young cat, you know, we don't want the cat to outlive the person and then have the cat be without a home. So the first thing I say is consider age. I'm a big fan of senior cats for senior, senior citizens. Um, but, you know, you don't want a cat who's probably overly playful. You maybe want a cat who's more of a lap cat. And if you go into a shelter and you talk to the shelter staff about their cats, they can direct you to the cats who are like a little more, um, you know, more into kind of napping and cuddling than they are running around the house and jumping and playing. So there are so many different personalities. The cats are all very different. But I find the best, best thing to do is when you go to adopt, let the shelter know the type of cat that you are looking for and they can make that match. They always know the personalities, the mannerisms and so forth of, of their cats. Um, you know, there are breeds like Maine Coons who, and you don't even have to have like a full um, pedigreed Maine Coon, you know, even a cat who has some Maine Coon in her, tend to be very affectionate, um, very, they'll follow you around. But honestly, you know, your basic domestic short hair cat, you know, there's many cats who that's their nature and their, um, you know, the, their manner as well. So I would say the number one thing is talk, have a good conversation with the place where you're adopting the cat and, you know, make sure that the person really spends some time with the cat before adopting and hopefully you'll have a good match. Uh, and Rachel, uh, final question. Uh, how uh, can someone uh, find out more information about you if they want to follow up uh, with you? Yeah, so if I didn't get to your question tonight or if you want to follow up, you can go to my website, drrachelcatbehavior.com. Um, I... I do all of my work completely free of charge. So feel free to submit your question and you know I'll get to you as soon as I can. But um, I have some videos and things too on my website. So maybe one of you, some of your questions may even be answered by a video that I have. But yeah, drrachelcatbehavior.com. I figured some people might be eating dinner. So I skipped all the pee, the pee and poop questions, uh, Rachel. So uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we really only got to about half the questions. Uh, really great uh, audience engagement. Lots of questions and comments, which is always a good sign. Uh, Rachel, I want to thank you for donating your time tonight and uh, being so generous uh, with it. And uh, I again want to uh, thank the uh, partnering libraries, including Atkinson, Merrimack, Georgetown, Danvers, Raleigh, Ashland, Wilmington, Clinton, and Andover. Uh, I want to uh, remind folks you'll get an email from me tomorrow morning with a link to a feedback survey. Please take 30 seconds and fill that out. And also you'll get a link to this recording. Uh, Rachel, any last words before we wrap up? I would say my last words are, you know, I'm happy to come back and do this again if you feel like there are a lot of people who still might want to have their question answered in this interactive format. But i um, so thrilled that so many people took time out of their busy weeks to learn about 
cats. That just makes me very, very happy. There's a lot of options out there and you guys chose to learn more about your cat. So yay, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you all. Everyone have a great rest of your night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.